So today we're getting ready for the midterm exam, which is going to happen next class. Um, and for those who are streaming, remember it next it's required to take the exam in class. You cannot take it online. So you got to come in next class on Wednesday uh, in order to... Thursday, sorry. Next Thursday, March 15th, come in and take the exam. Okay. So uh, I've prepared some information for you guys to study. Um, if you go to the modules, click on the modules view, and then come down to the tab that says midterm exam, and you click on the midterm exam review, and this page will open up. Uh, so it's telling us that there are 40 questions on the exam. It's a mixture of multiple choice or true false questions. Uh, questions are about chapters one through seven of the textbook. Um, they are uh, uh, all drawn from a question bank that we have seen through the cahoots that we've been doing at the end of every class. So uh, out of about 75, close to 80 questions that are in the cahoots, uh, you'll be seeing 40 of them. Some of them are repeated from the quiz that we took in the uh, fourth week of the class. Those are ones from chapters one through three. Um, and so, you know, the best way to prepare is to look over the PowerPoints. And uh, the PowerPoints are all visible and available to you in the modules, right? Uh, so each week we'll have um, PowerPoint summaries. And then uh, the cahoots themselves, I've recreated them as challenges. Uh, so a Kahoot challenge is um, something that you uh, have to play off of a smartphone or a mobile app. You can't actually play it from a, a, um, a laptop, unfortunately. There's some kind of strategy they have. Uh, has anyone already been in to play these challenges? Functional? OK, great. So uh, um, it's up there for you. Um, and here's the instructions about how to do it. Uh, if you don't have a smartphone or that kind of device, talk to me at the end of class. Be sure you talk to me. I can maybe set you up with some kind of alternative that would work on a laptop. Um, but also, today we're going to step through this, sort of uh, get the major points from the PowerPoints, and we'll play the cahoots here in class. Uh, so the other thing you could always do is, uh, I'm not sure if the streaming uh, will actually, the archive will actually be up before the exam. Uh, but that might be another possibility. Uh, or feel free to take a picture or make any notes you want during this, uh, this session. Um, so that's another way you could you know, get a hold of the information to study. Um, <clears throat> so I'm glad some folks have already tried out the cahoots and that they're functional. Like I said, we'll look at them this class. Any questions about the format of the exam? Is it on paper in here, 40 questions, multiple choice or true, false? Covering chapters one through seven, so everything we've talked about so far. We're good? Uh, so you can keep taking the cahoots over and over again? Uh, once you open one up, I think you can repeat it, yeah. Okay. But it's not like you close it and then open it again and again and again. I think within it, you can just keep running through it. Am, am I right about that, Ivan? Do you, yeah. yeah, you can. Yeah. You just have to download that app. OK. And then you can play by yourself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's, the, that's why they call it a challenge instead of like we do in class. Basically playing by yourself. OK. <clears throat> Good. So let us uh, take a look at all this. And uh, OK, it's, uh, it turns out to be a lot of information, which is why I try to kind of focus in on the stuff that we really need to know in this review class. Um, and take heart. Uh, the final exam is not cumulative, so you won't see this stuff again. We'll see new stuff on the final. Okay, so. There we go. All right, so let's take a quick look through uh, chapter one, just to look out for important stuff. So remember chapter one gave us some models of communication and some very broad overview of electronic media, some concepts that we need to remember. And uh, then going forward, we get into more specific histories of the different media themselves. Um, so <clears throat> I'm looking over some of these things. Um, 
let's take a look. Just looking at, this is important. So first of all, the mathematical model of communication, which uh, is really could be simplified into, you know, sort of a, a sender and a receiver with a channel in between them. And then the opportunity we talked about for feedback as the receiver, who in our case, these would be audiences, as the receiver can get feedback, uh, provide feedback to the sender, which would be broadcasters. And so this is a, a very common, you know, easy to understand model of mass communication. Uh, and it's called the mathematical model. Uh, it comes from Shannon and Weaver's work. So that's the mathematical model of communication. And uh, looking forward further along here. Oh yeah, okay, so this is important. Um, when we consume electronic media, theorists have broken it down into different effects, broad effects that we get from the uh, mass media. So um, cognitive effects, first of all, what this means is when you're, let's say, watching television, and uh, uh, you're learning something, you're getting information from it, so that's a cognitive effect. An emotional effect would be if you're watching a television show and it's you know, uh, <clears throat> dramatic or something and you tear up or feel like crying. A behavioral effect might be if uh, an advertisement you know, convinces you that you absolutely need to go get a beer during the commercial or something, so that would influence your behavior, right? So then you'd run off. So just remember those three different concepts, what, what they refer to. Now let's see, ah oh, yeah, another interesting thing, important thing, was uh, we broke down media based on either asynchronous or synchronous media. So remember, synchronous media is media that's consumed almost the minute that it's broadcast, so, or well, the second that it's broadcast, so like a, a live telecast of the Oscars or of a, the Super Bowl or something. So that's synchronous. As it's being broadcast to us, we are consuming it at the same time. Okay? Asynchronous is the opposite. That's when we can uh, consume media sometime after it's being made available, let's say. So that might be Netflix, you know, see a show 20 years after it's already being created and broadcast for the first time. Or it could be something like email. Uh, or, so we often call this on-demand, you know, on-demand programming because we're not, we're not tied to a synchronous schedule. We can watch it when we want. So that's asynchronous. Uh, we also talked about, uh, you know, the changing nature of broadcasting and the most impactful change that we've had really since we managed to get a printing press to, you know, produce multiple copies of printed material is digitization. It's the biggest revolution since the printing press. Uh, because it's made all media available to us in the same digital format through uh, you know, a computer or a smartphone. Uh, but we get audio, we get video, we get uh, um, uh, text as we used to, written stuff. So a whole multimedia Multimedia uh, uh, communication, you know, all through the process of digitization. And one of the things that we've seen along with that is convergence. When digitization allows us to take a song and turn it into a stream of bits, or take a video and turn that into a stream of bits, which might go on YouTube, you know, or put textual information up on any web page. It all comes down to bits, and it's all being received now largely through our mobile devices. And so this notion of convergence, where media that used to be distinct, radio or recorded music and video, you, know, you used to have to have a radio, you used to have a, have a TV, but now all forms of media are converging together. So that's the idea of convergence, that the lines between different media, which used to define you know, a business, I'm in the radio business, you're in a TV business, it's a different business. Now it's sort of all in the content delivery business, you know. Uh, uh, so that's the convergence is that uh, the boundaries between the different media are all coming, you know, the boundaries are falling down. Things are coming together. 
Um, what else do we see here in terms of um, other stuff we should talk about? Oh, well, there's convergence, blurring of boundaries and platforms. I should have just kept looking in my slides for questions. OK, well, it looks like that's, those are the main points out of uh, the first chapter. I'm sure I've forgotten some things, so let's head off right away and take a look at the Kahoot and see what, uh, there we go. <clears throat> Behind the hood. Let's play chapter one, <clears throat> see what we forgot here. As I said, you'll be facing a subset of these questions when it's, uh, and maybe if I just do a challenge, oh no, challenge is okay. So there is already a challenge up, as I said, all those, Ivan's already played it. Um, it'll go offline at noon on Wednesday. So be sure it won't be available for extremely last minute cramming. So be sure you get to it before noon. Which one are you talking about? Uh, these things that we're playing right now, Tom. Oh. These things? Yeah. Thank you, sir. Oh, for sure. Well, let's just, uh, did you guys want to <laughs> play these competitively? Uh, I don't know. We need at least one person logging in, but uh, I would understand if you didn't want to play them all over again. But um, maybe if, if one person could log in at least, we can go. Anyone want to be our... <laughs> I could always do it. I, guess. I know it was kind of long. Nine questions. We are ready. Whose model of communication is known as the mathematical model? Guys? You want to just... Can we call it out, too, so we don't have to wait for all this in silence? It's pretty deadly. Hey guys, we're talking Shannon and Weaver, right? Let's, Shannon and Weaver, that is correct. All right, let's head on for the next one. Which is considered the nation's first mass medium? Okay, didn't cover this, so that's good. Which one would you say? Yeah. So it would be pre-electronic. Okay, we're going to skip through. Newspapers, got it. Good job. Newspapers. Convergence happens when different types of media become the same. True or false? We definitely covered that one. All right, good. True, yeah. You guys are sh hot shots. Localism doesn't matter to radio stations anymore. Well, that's a weird one, but you probably know that. False. And one more, one more. All right, we'll skip it. It's false. That's right. So localism definitely does matter to radio because it's one of the ways that it can compete against uh, satellite or online radio, which is kind of placeless because uh, it doesn't originate from your city, it originates from, you know, wherever. So uh, if you happen to like, you know, getting a local vibe from your media, and some people do, then terrestrial radio is still great. What do you call messages that are received almost instantaneously after? Almost instantaneously after. One more, one more. Somebody get in there and answer. Awesome. Thank you. Synchronous. That's right. So our example was the Super Bowl or the Oscars. You're watching live because you care who's going to win. 31. What is probably the most revolutionary innovation since the printing press? Awesome. Digitization. Correct. Turns everything into bits. And then we can stream them or download them. Digital that stations offer multiple channels in their frequency. Wow, how did that wind up in there? Okay, all right, let's see. Oh well, yeah, it was even split, right? Don't remember this one. Uh, so it, it is true, digital, digital radio, for instance, or in, in high definition television as well, you may certainly have noticed that, uh, you know, uh, they can have sub channels. So like the public broadcaster here, KQED, will have their main channel plus two sub channels that they can fit into the same bandwidth that uh, they've always had to broadcast on, but because of digital compression, they can fit more in. And remember, the radio system is called IBOC radio. Um, well, actually, they call it HD radio, right? But the technology is IBOC, stands for in-band on-channel. And what that means is the same thing for radio. You could have, you know, like uh, 98.1 FM, but when that broadcasts digitally, you could have, you know, several stations going through the same bandwidth that the FM station used to have. But these would be digital. So I guess, you know, another takeaway from this is that when we have that revolutionary digitization of content, digital compression allows us to use our bandwidth much more efficiently. Hey, which kind of an effect is it when we learn something from the mass media? Hey, boom, got it, right? So it is a cognitive effect when we learn something, all 
right? Emotional when we feel something, behavioral when we go do something. Which of the following statements is true? Ah, the internet has full First Amendment protection. It's all true. The fairness doctrine is no longer in place. The FCC treats subscription media differently than broadcasts. My goodness. I can tell you about that in a sec. Everyone answer? Let's skip it. Go through, through. It was like a 50-50 split, the truth. So um, the, 50, the FCC treats subscription media differently than broadcast media. Um, so what that means is that if you're an HBO or you're a, a Netflix, you don't have the same uh, content restrictions on you that you do if you're a broadcaster. And we're going to have more about regulation when the time comes. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, just for now, you probably all heard there's those seven dirty words that you can't say on TV or the radio. Uh, so uh, the FCC can regulate um, the, the airwaves, uh, but not subscription services, which pass through cable or the Internet. Good job, folks. No, I don't want to say the results. Want to just get out of this one. All right, so uh, we will get back to cahoots when we do number two. So let's see what we can figure out from uh, the PowerPoints on chapter two, which, as you remember, picked up the history of broadcasting from uh, the radio. Radio. Cool. Um, so the first thing we established way back when was that they didn't really know that there could be a broadcasting industry when they first came upon radio. They were thinking about it as point to point rather than one to many, which is the mass mediated model. But they soon figured that out. Um, so here are some of the important uh, uh, inventors who cumulatively together gave us radio, AM radio at that time, right? Um, so people to remember, I guess, would be Heinrich Hertz. Demonstrated radio waves actually existed. So we saw the spark gap experiment. We saw it on a video, which demonstrated that energy in one part of the room could mysteriously like jump and produce an effect in another part of the room due to the radio waves. Marconi um, made the first practical demonstration of radio waves. So he's often considered, you know, the the father of radio. And DeForest, um, importantly, created the Audion tube, right, which was a, a very important piece that amplified the signal and repeated it. So it was important um, to, uh, to, you know, to move away from those little radio sets where you had an earplug and you could barely hear it to something that you could you know, get at a long distance. Um, all right. Let's see. Uh, we also discovered the need for um, regulation. And here the, uh, the logic for being able to regulate broadcasting despite the First Amendment, which said that the government should not restrict uh, the, the uh, freedom, of, freedom of expression through the press, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, in this case, um, the logic was, well, the airwaves belong to the people. It's like a public good. So the government should be able to regulate it just the way they regulate, you know, access to waterways and, and other stuff like that. It's a scarce resource. They need to kind of protect it and uh, apportion it for us on our behalf. That's what they're... So uh, important, important next step in regulation came with the Radio Act of 1927, uh, creating the Federal Radio Commission, which soon became the FCC soon after. Okay, but here's the important thing, right? Uh, because prior to this act of, of regulation, uh, radio stations were all on the same frequency um, because couldn't figure out, like, okay, there was no apportionment of frequency. So you'd start off in your city or something, and you'd pick the clearest frequency. There are certain channels that are more powerful than others. So everyone got onto that. And then they said, well, maybe you should take turns. So you can go from 6 to 8, and the other people can go from 8 till 10, stuff like that. So uh, um, there, was, there was a problem, uh, just the need to create an even playing field so that a broadcasting business could be created with a certain assurance that if you invested in a transmitter and everything necessary, that you, know, you would have uh, a, 
a, a frequency that people could listen to you on, and uh, you know the right to conduct your business without uh, uh, you know technological interference from your competitors and stuff. All of that came out of uh, out of the uh, um, the Radio Act. So all the, all the stations were on the same frequency. They were encouraged to take turns. And uh, it was really necessary to regulate this if you wanted to have commercial radio, a business, actually working. Because otherwise, you know, it's just too risky to jump in there. OK. Um, let's head on further. Um, <clears throat> the rise of networks. I think that's a little bit further back. Yeah, there we go. So the individual stations started up as startups do in this day. Back in those days, they did too. Uh, but they soon found that they needed um, more, more content than they could actually provide on their own. Uh, thus was born the notion of chain broadcasting, so that one station could originate some programming and send it to another station. And this happened via telephone line. Uh, but there, quickly soon after, came the idea, well, we could, you know, uh, make this a kind of a permanent arrangement, um, and let's have networks. And so that's when they discovered uh, the, you know, the idea that, uh, uh, you know, economy of scale. Let's say that that you could create a program and distribute it through many, many different stations through chain broadcasting. That's what networks were called back in the day. Um, so you could distribute the same programming to a bunch of different stations and thereby solve their problem. They needed that program, station interconnection. Um, and that comes to, you know, today's day and age where, um, I don't even know where this will be on a slide or something, but talking of broadcasting uh, and chain broadcasting, which became networks, you know, now, an important business relationship is, you know, the network, like let's say ABC, and its affiliate stations. So affiliates, that's, you know, people often say, what's that word all about? Well, this is a, this is a private business, but has signed a contract with the network uh, to air all of its programming. And so they've become a, an affiliate of the big network. So um, this is, you know, the way that uh, U.S. broadcasting is organized. You know, private ownership. Now there may be big companies which own literally hundreds of stations, you know, uh, and even some networks that own stations themselves but they don't own the totality of all of the broadcast stations that are out there. You know, there are, there are far more affiliate stations that are privately owned than there are network stations, you know, that are owned and operated. So that, that, that relationship is pretty important. And in fact, we should probably talk about um, television because this is where we, need, we learned a lot more about the affiliate network uh, relationship. Uh, but we don't want to forget about FM radio, right? Because so far we've been talking about AM, and we know that FM um, was available early in the 1930s. Edwin Howard Armstrong uh, pretty much single-handedly created FM radio, uh, but through you know business business uh, uh, dirty trickery or whatever. <laughs> Um, that great invention was held back for decades. Um, remember Armstrong had a fight with David Sarnoff, the head of, uh, the head of RCA, and a uh, um, long, you know, decade-long court battle, which resulted finally with Armstrong uh, committing suicide in a depression over um, strife with his family and, uh, and the, you know, all of the troubles he'd had. Um, having his brilliant system recognized. So it wasn't until the uh, late 50s, early 60s that FM actually took off. So uh, kind of proof that the best technology doesn't always win. Uh, and I don't think we've got good enough. If we have other stuff, we'll pick it up in the cahoots, right? So here we go. Chapter two, cahoots. 
David Sarnoff's radio music box memo described a way to make money from broadcast radio. We mentioned Sarnoff, but not that. So. True, absolutely. Thanks, folks. So yeah, Sarnoff was, uh, um, you know, first he worked for American Marconi. So he was around right from the beginnings of, uh, of radio when they didn't even think of turning it into an entertainment medium. Uh, but uh, he did write a memo. Um, and uh, in it, he suggested it could be a music box in the home. So that's true there. Radio news was controversial. The press radio war happened, settled by the Biltmore Agreement. Wow, I forgot to cover a bunch of these. All right. So is that true? Let's skip through and answer it. Ooh, we got a 50-50 split there. So it's true. Um, uh, newspaper business looked on radio as a potential, uh, you know, uh, killer of <laughs> their audience because people could get the news so much faster through radio than they could through the newspapers. So they wouldn't share any of their reporting or their information. And uh, uh, that, after a while, that was settled with the Biltmore Agreement, where the radio stations agreed not to broadcast the news until after the evening uh, newspaper uh, edition had been sold. That didn't last for long, but it did sort of create that collaboration. Who invented FM radio? All right, we're going to skip it. Yes, it was Edwin Howard Armstrong, OK? So Hertz, Hertz, that was the other proposition. Uh, Hertz is the person who uh, demonstrated uh, electromagnetic energy. But, um, it was Howard Armstrong who <coughs> created FM. Who proved that electro, oops, there we go. <laughs> who proved that electromagnetic energy traveled through the air? Uh, I just gave you that one. OK, so Whoop. it was Hertz, Heinrich Hertz. And in the audio classes, you know, we talk about frequency. We, you know, use Hertz's, we, we you know, abbreviate his name. But he was so important to our understanding of uh, energy that we honor him that way by uh, using his name as a, a measurement of, uh, of frequency. Lee DeForest invented what? The F valve. <laughs> the audion tube, OK? Is, is, Audion tube. Okay, so remember that was the crucial amplifier. Congress has a right to regulate broadcasting because. All right, whoa, it didn't fool anybody. My goodness, you guys are great. The airways belong to the people. That's right. So that's the, uh, the logic that the government used to say, yeah, we should regulate. Even though we don't have the right to stop people's free speech, we should be able to regulate the airways. What we today refer to as a network was, what was it called in the 1920s? Oh, you're good. It was called chain broadcasting. Absolutely. And prior to the Radio Act of 1927, what was going on? All of the above. Well, all of the below. Uh, all radio stations were on the same frequency. They were encouraged to take turns. And legislation was inadequate to regulate commercial radio. Absolutely right. All of the above. Okay, so that's when in 1927 they did the, um, the Radio Act uh, in order to make you know a uh, broadcast system which was going to be uh, or orderly enough for people to risk investing in as a business. Westinghouse was interested in broadcasting because it would make more revenue from advertising, allow them to sell more radio receivers improve the moral climate of wholesome entertainment. OK, so the correct answer was allow them to sell more radio receivers. So I missed this in the PowerPoints. But basically what happened after the First World War, which as you remember, perhaps um, the US government took over all the patents and pooled the patents to uh, radio. And uh, when they came back from the war, and uh, you know, it was uh, radio was technically much improved, but the communication companies like American Marconi, uh, which became RCA, uh, Westinghouse, and AT&T, which was you know the phone company, they all split up the broadcasting business. Basically, as it was just beginning, they made agreements so that, for instance, Westinghouse would manufacture 
uh, uh, radio sets and sell them. And AT&T would interconnect the stations for chain broadcasting. And uh, uh, you know, RCA, uh, which soon created the NBC network, went into the content and advertising business. You know? So that's how they split it up. So Westinghouse would not, for instance, have been selling any advertising because what they were doing was selling receivers. That was their part of the business. AT&T wouldn't have been involved in any of that because they were laying the long distance lines to connect those stations. That's how that works. Radio stations profited during World War II because advertisers bought radio ads instead of print. And we'll skip right ahead. Yes, whoops, sorry. <laughs> Can I get that page back? Everybody got it right? That is true. So, uh, um, you know, print was being rationed. The army needed paper. And uh, broadcast did very well because they didn't need uh, any, any resources like paper. So advertisers went to them. Cool. All right. Any questions so far? Okay, let me stay on this side. Let's head back to... Where are we going? We're going to PowerPoint, chapter three. And chapter three was concerning television history, right? Um, so as we said, there's uh, a lot more to know about um, kind of the business relationships that uh, were created there. However, let's <laughs> first off, uh, see who was involved in the early um, development of television. So we remember that uh, John Logie Baird had a mechanical system and Felix the Cat over there is about the clearest picture that ever came out of that. Uh, and then you remember Zyorkin and Philo T. Farnsworth were in a race. Uh, Zyorkin was financed by, uh, uh, by RCA. <laughs> which meant that he had considerably more resources than uh, Farnsworth. Uh, so they were in a race to actually uh, uh, create a functional electronic television system. Uh, and of course, the big money was going to be had by getting the patents and then um, licensing them to, uh, you know. So even though Farnsworth develops TV, he eventually licenses his patents to RCA. Um, TV comes out in 1939 at the World's Fair. But uh, it doesn't, um, doesn't take off because the Second World War diverted all of the resources and production that would have been necessary to gear up and produce millions of TV sets. Uh, they had to use their uh, electronics uh, capabilities for radar and for the war effort. Um, so it didn't really come back until after World War II. Um, but it did premiere at the World's Fair in 1939, which was very kind of futuristic, that whole thing. Um, so let's have a look here. Uh, right, so we did talk about um, the network affiliate relationship. So uh, when television arose as a business, the same networks that had dominated radio took over television as well. Um, they controlled TV programming. And they were able to build the industry with profits from uh, radio networks. Um, so there are some advantages of, of network affiliate re relationships. Um, so it's a deal basically struck between the network and the private stations that become affiliates. Uh, you have to sign a contract. Uh, and what the private station agrees to is what they call clearance, which means that Everything that the network wants shown, the private station, the affiliate station, has to show it. Uh, so that's the deal. You know, we'll give you all our programming, but you have to promise to show it all. And the reason for that, of course, is because everyone's selling advertising. And uh, the network is selling advertising in certain parts of the hour. And so they've got to um, uh, have a promise from all the stations all over the country that they'll actually show the state, you know, the shows and the advertisements that they are sent. So clearance is, a, is an important thing. And back in the day, there was station compensation. In, a, in, in exchange for being an affiliate and promising clearance that you would show everything they gave you, 
you'd get compensated. They would write you a check. But that is kind of turned around now, as we saw. Now that sports, stuff like that is so expensive, uh, you've got the network asking the affiliates sometimes to pay them, to participate in paying for very expensive sports licenses and stuff. Let's see, what else have we got here? Um, yeah, so uh, on this slide they're talking about television by wire, it's cable TV. So cable TV, as we remember, was first just a way of giving people better reception of originally transmitted television. However, cable starts to be able to have more channels on it and to even create original cable networks. And uh, at some point in there, there are um, rules created um, called, uh, and where are we here? It should be on somewhere around here. Carriage rules. Sorry, I may not be able to scan these slides fast enough to find the exact one. Um, there's, there's the must carry rule, which would be part of it. Um, so these are, just right, I'm, I'm writing carriage, like horse and carriage, but what they, what they mean is to carry, like must carry. So the logic here was the FCC wanted to protect the uh, broadcasters who were over the air, the original licensees, which established business. They didn't want to mess that up by giving too much freedom to the cable industry. So they created a rule that wherever cable came in and created its you know, system in a city like San Francisco, they had to carry the major stations in the San Francisco area. They couldn't, for instance, go get an NBC affiliate from Los Angeles and strike a better deal and bring them up here, thus cutting out the NBC affiliate in San Francisco. So that's the must-carry rule, that you have to carry the stations, the major stations that are in the, uh, in, in, in the, in the area that you're working in. So it was a way of, of uh, protecting the original broadcasters. Uh, well, I didn't see more stuff that we have to talk about. So let's dip into Kahoot for number three. Chapter 3, where is it? Oh, it's way up there. Okay. In 1961, who referred to television as a vast wasteland? Oh yeah, he had a funny name. The correct answer was Newton Minow, a small fish in a big pond. So he said he called TV a vast wasteland because it didn't show educational stuff. FM radio had better quality than AM. Broadcasters immediately switched over to FM. Okay, ooh, we shouldn't have a 50-50 split there. As I said, uh, AM radio, uh, FM existed in 1930, but it wasn't until 1960 that it really caught on, okay? Because it was suppressed by RCA. They wanted everyone buying TV sets, not FM. Who was associated with the invention of TV? So there's only one name in there that you should recognize. Philo T, that's right. Sarnoff bought, thought radio could make money by becoming something in the home. A music box, that was his memo, right? He suggested music. Just as with radio, early television was dominated by networks. True or false? True, absolutely, true. A TV station that associates with a network to play all of its programs is called what? All right, everyone got it. It's an affiliate, that's right, okay. Television made its first public debut when and where? Thank you. 1939, New York World's Fair. Everyone got it. Good. All right. Cable television originally started. Huh. What are our options here? In hopes of competing with movies, an experiment for two-way communications, to bring TV into remote areas where reception was bad, as a joint venture with AT&T and local telephone companies. Let's see. Okay. That didn't go too well to bring TV into remote areas where reception was bad. Remember what we said is, you know, uh, cable was originally just giving you the same channels that were over the air, but improving reception by putting an antenna up on a mountain, for instance, where you could get good reception. The Advanced Television System Committee adopted the broadcast standard used as HDTV. All right, well, that is true, <laughs> okay. And finally, over-the-top TV. Oh, okay, that's interesting. All right.
point. Anyone going to take a shot? Ooh, everybody got it right. Exactly. So OTT, over the top, refers to streaming services like Roku, Apple TV, uh, and others that uh, plug directly into your TV. So they're going over the top of the cable box, which in the business was the hardware device um, which uh, guaranteed kind of control over the incoming uh, uh, programming into your home. All right, that wasn't too bad. Let's check out chapter four. And let's see where we need to go. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, uh, before we jump into chapter four, let's just talk about um, a couple of programming strategies, uh, or actually maybe, is, is that what's in? Yeah, programming is in here, okay. Well, no, let's, let's look through these slides and see what we can find. All right, I don't think we have to deal too much with uh, radio. However, you know, um, one thing we did say is once TV took over many of the f show formats from radio, uh, radio itself had to reinvent itself, and it did it by turning to playing pre-recorded music. Uh, and at that time, you know, the big wave was in uh, rock and roll. So it's not unfair to say that rock and roll uh, saved, saved the radio industry by giving them something to play now that all the stars and the other types of shows had moved over to TV. All right. So if you look at the current uh, radio industry, we have many more formats, but um, recorded music has been big for a long, long time. Um, yeah, here's an important thing to remember. So this is called a, uh, either a hot clock or a program wheel, right? But remember what these are is this, this represents an hour of radio programming. And so the purpose of this is, you know, you schedule what goes on the air long in advance, sometimes months in advance, um, and this, of course, is all on a computer now. But what it lets you do is to organize all the elements of your program in, in your, your hour in the most efficient way possible, you know, so that uh, uh, you've already calculated that, you know, the people getting in their car, driving to work, want to hear some constant music so they get settled into the channel before you hit them with some commercials when they might tune out. And then you're going to you know, schedule news at a certain time, traffic reports at a certain time. So the purpose of this hot clock, it's called, is to uh, you know, use, organize the program elements as efficiently po as possible within the hour. Okay? There's no improvisation anymore. It's all programmed in advance on the hot clock. So that, that's important. Um, types of TV programs, we didn't. There's no questions on this. Um, let's see here. We may come back to this in a second, but I'm kind of running towards, um, there we go, some programming strategies, all right? So who remembers what temp polling refers to? Uh, yeah, Ron? Isn't it having like one really strong program right in the middle, right between two weaker programs? Exactly right, that's right. So let's say, Program A is pretty weak. Program B is a very successful show. Program C is another new or weak show. You know, the, the, the tent pole show can hold up your evening and maybe even get, you know, some people at the start and end of the other show, uh, they, they get counted in the ratings. So this is a programming strategy called tent polling, and it is in order to improve ratings. And so you could imagine that hammocking refers to, you know, A and C are well-rated, you know, they have good ratings, whereas B is kind of, kind of a poorly performing show, but it gets kind of propped up by uh, the good, the, you know, the well, the, the performing shows, the shows that are doing well around it. Uh, let me see, part, you, you guys remember what bridging referred to? This one's a little bit more obscure. Bridging? Yeah, Dylan, you had your hand up earlier. You want to take a shot at bridging, just in case? You remember what it is? Uh, it's obscure. No, <laughs> so you don't remember. OK, I'm not surprised. Bridging refers to uh, um, uh, in the transition between one show to the next show, 
starting the second show immediately so that uh, without a commercial break in order to get audiences to sit, you know, continue right through one show into the next show because typically you lose people during commercial breaks. So by bridging, which is basically you're bridging the gap between the two shows, um, you can, you can uh, el eliminate that problem. <laughs> yep, it's all, it's all pretty manipulative, okay. Um, how about blocking? What would that refer to? Give me an example of a block, Ron? Wouldn't that be in, having like an entire genre of shows, like all comedy, all action? Exactly. So Ron, for our streamers, Ron said that, uh, yeah, a block of, sh of shows would be uh, a group of shows that are all the same genre, the same type. So, you know, uh, adult animation on Sunday night on Fox or situation comedies on NBC on Thursday nights or that kind of thing. Uh, you, block, you block program by putting all of the same type of shows together. Absolutely. Um, Okay, and then uh, we also talked about, whoops, let's see if I can find something here, page for programs. Okay, yeah, this is important, this one here. So um, I may have to explain this just for a little second or so. So many television shows are ordered by networks. You know, the primetime shows that most of us think of when we think of like what's good TV. If it's on a broadcast network like CBS, ABC, NBC, they make the order for particular shows. But there are also television shows that are financed and created to sell to local stations. Um, and this is a different market. It's called syndication. All right. Um, so syndicated shows come in two types, what they call off-network or first-run. So syndicators, sometimes they will buy up shows that were original network shows, like, I don't know, How I Met Your Mother, uh, House, uh, Frasier, I mean, this is probably not, uh, Seinfeld, right? In the days before being able to watch all of this on Hulu or Netflix, and those days were only about five years ago, uh, syndicators would buy these shows that were originally created for networks. So we call them, now that they've gone off of the network, they go into syndication. So these are off network, and then uh, there are also original shows. And these would be like Dr. Phil or Jeopardy. So a lot of game shows, a lot of sort of midday programming. And that would be original, first-run syndicated shows. So that means that they were never created to go onto a network. They were created to sell to local stations that need to fill in stuff when the network programming, when they don't have any network program, because the network doesn't give them 24 hours a day. So that's uh, a different part of the business, uh, which is actually hugely, you know, it, there's a lot of money in syndicated programming, but that's what that refers to. So most often when you're seeing reruns, you're seeing off-network syndicated shows. Okay, cool. And I think that's probably all we want to say on that. So let's hit up Kahoot number four. A network schedules a new or weak program between two strong ones. What is that called? Okay, two, so a weak program between two strong ones. You can even draw out this picture for yourself, you know, so that's hammocking, right? Because it looks like a hammock strung between two trees. A network programs uh, places four situation comedies into a two hour time period. So it stacks them all together. What do you call that? Blocking was the correct answer. So remember block programming, you got four shows of the same type in a block. Okay, so remember that. And next up, the network programs a show so that it runs over the starting time of the next program, keeping your audience involved in there. What would that be? That was bridging, right? That's what I tried to draw here. You go directly from one show into the next. ESPN is a, ooh, is a what? An expensive cable channel? 
Okay. ESPN, a cable network, that's right. So original cable programming. How I Met Your Mother, first broadcast on CBS, now in syndication, is an example of what type? Uh, excellent, off-network syndicated program. Okay, so if it originally appeared on a network and now it's on reruns, it's called off-network. To differentiate themselves, radio stations program music according to a specific what? The answer is format. Good job, guys. It's a format. So format radio means you've got a hip-hop station, you've got an oldie station, and so on. A big reason radio could reinvent itself in the 50s was... All right. See, advertisers is not a good choice because there's been advertisers in radio since 1920. But the taste for rock and roll music allowed radio to reinvent itself as a music pre-recorded music delivery. Another name for the program wheel used to schedule radio shows. It is, right, the hot clock, a radio hot clock. A song played very often on music radio is said to be in heavy what? So you hear the song all the time. It's in heavy, boom, heavy rotation, heavy rotation. Because it, you, think around, you think around the clock, it's, it comes back, that's the rotation. Non-commercial radio stations such as KQED 88.5 megahertz get underwriting rather than advertising. Fair enough. Yes, it's true. So uh, as an alternative to the commercial model where uh, advertisers pay for spot time, um, there is public radio, which, as you know, survives by uh, having uh, um, underwriters rather than advertisers. OK, cool. Now there's only 10 minutes left, so I propose that we jump right into more cahoots, just so we have a chance to discuss this, so we can probably get through it. So let's head to chapter five. Please do ask any questions or for clarification, because I'm not going through the PowerPoints. I kind of feel bad. Who's the father of the internet? Either Vince Cerf or Tim Berners-Lee. Only two teams is a choice here. All right, those who chose Vince Cerf, correct. Tim Berners-Lee, we would say, is the father of the World Wide Web because he's uh, created the HTTP protocol that is part of the World Wide Web. The internet is a packet switched network. True or false? It is true, the internet is packet switch. So what that means is all of the data that uh, goes over the internet is chunked into packets and sent with an address for each packet and it is then reassembled at your computer. So that's what packet switching refers to and mobile phone cellular data is also packet switched so your conversation is chunked into packets and sent that way too. Some kind of viewing is when we use the net out of habit without a clear goal. So yes, ritualistic viewing, all right? So I don't know if everyone got lucky there or if it's really so obvious, but instrumental viewing would, say, would mean that uh, you know, you're watching something or consuming something with a purpose in mind. So it's instrumental. I want this and the internet becomes the instrument of me finding something out versus ritualistic is something that you do over and over again, you know, for the sake of doing it. So just surfing, spending an hour, you know, that's ritualistic. Online data is limitless, but speed is controlled by what? Bandwidth, absolutely right. So when we get what we call broadband, which is, you know, delivered by Comcast, your phone company, or third parties like Sonic, through fiber optic connections now, uh, we get really fast movement of data. So we could have all of the storage available that we wanted to before, but until we got high speed internet, which means broadband, there's a broadband through which data can flow, uh, we couldn't get video and 4K video and Netflix over the internet. So speed is controlled by bandwidth. What type of app helps you surf the web? What do we call Netflix, uh, sorry, not Netflix, Chrome, uh, Netscape was the original one. It is a browser, right, that's the app. How much do webcasters pay in royalty fees? Oh, that's interesting. Everybody got it right, yes. So uh, webcasters, people who stream music over the internet, 
Um, they have to pay musicians and composers uh, seven cents per listener, 0 0.07 cents per listener per song, versus terrestrial radio stations, which have to pay a percentage of annual revenue. So it's a very different calculation. All right. Streaming technology, something about streaming technology. What? Pushes a continuous flow of data through the net, leaves users with a file they can share on their computer. So which one sounds more like streaming? OK, yes, that is correct. So think about the difference between watching a video on YouTube where you've got to have a live internet connection and you can stream, let's say, your favorite song, your, the video for your favorite song that way. So that's a continuous flow of data has to go through the internet. But if you subscribe to podcasts, like I do, uh, you can be disconnected from the internet, close off your cellular data and everything. The file exists on your device and you can play it back. So it's kind of different. Two different ways of you know, giving you programming over the internet. Short episodes on YouTube are called webisodes. Excellent. Everybody got it. Of course they are. The web is great for news because, oh, and multiple answers are possible. The internet has totally reliable information? I don't think so. Uh, but the internet can give us multimedia presentation of stories? Absolutely. Instant updates? Absolutely. And limitless space on news websites. So the only one that sucked was totally reliable information. Zero people got it wrong. So that's great. Um, so there were three right answers there. Forgive me for moving so fast. We've got five more minutes. And uh, how many more we got? That was chapter five, right? Let's head for chapter six. Well, let's get through this, and then I'll have that other one for you. Chapter six. Does internet telephone use packet switching technology? Oh, well, it does. So, uh, it, you know, just the way the internet uh, chunks up data into packets and sends it over the network. So do cell phones now, uh, which makes their uh, use of their bandwidth much, much more efficient. Google Glass was well received by consumers. No, it's false because we uh, aren't all wearing Google Glasses. We all got cell phones, but no Google Glasses. Smart personal object technology is in. This is pure guesswork, right? Apple Watch, good for you. The person who guessed Apple Watch, correct. So smart personal object technology, it's a class of technology uh, which is gonna be used in wearable clothing like watches and other wearable devices now. Which company made the first PDA, so personal digital assistance? We saw a cool ad. Yes, it's Apple. The Apple Newton was the first of those PDAs really saw a lot of the functions of the cell phone in it before it came out. Early users of the internet had to connect to the internet via modems or routers. True, that's right. Remember that thing that went you know, That was it, the modem. Something is defined as machine to mean machine communications using cloud computing and networks of sensors. Okay, whoa. The Internet of Things. Wow, somebody is really on a roll here. <laughs> okay, so that is correct. The Internet of Things. So we talked about uh, you know that as the kind of the the next use of the internet, which still is using HTTP streaming protocol and stuff, but is now using it as sort of as machine to machine rather than human to machine. As I'm you know calling out web pages or something. Now my refrigerator is calling out inventory from Amazon because I'm out of milk, you know, or something like that, I'm using the same connections. Online audio, something about online audio is what? Allows listeners to hear almost any type of music, allows listeners to generate their own playlist. All of the above, right? Removes geographic restrictions imposed by traditional radio. So do remember, traditional radio still has an edge because it's local, because it's geographically restricted. OTT TV refers to, all right, so you guys got this already. Obviously, it's important. Oh, you're not going to go for it? Oh, it's getting audio or video over the internet, bypassing cable. So remember, OTT over the top of the cable box, all right? 
What was that? What was it called? OTT, over the top. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? It's like it's like something is supposed to be so crazy. It's over the top. What, what is it? What is OTT TV? It stands for over the top. It, yeah. it means having an internet connection right into your television set. Ah, okay. So you could get all of those channels that way. Sling TV is an example of place shifting. That's right. So Sling TV. Many people have heard of it, but um, and maybe some people have it. I don't know. If you uh, have Sling TV and you have a cable connect, uh, subscription, you can get all your cable channels delivered to your laptop if you're in another city or something like that. That's why they call it place shifting. You no longer have to be at home with your cable set top box. With Sling TV, you can shift the programming from the cable anywhere that you want where you, you know where your computer can get a connection and finally on demand digital streaming is available through yes netflix amazon hbo now all of them all right so they all give you on demand all right i know we're really whipping through this but if anyone wants a little clarification at the end of class uh, stick around we can take a few minutes and do that and then uh, last one, right? Chapter seven, Woo! the advertising one. And so just before we get into that, maybe while you're logging in, let me draw you a little picture, um, which represents the way broadcasting has paid for itself for years and years and years. You have audiences and you have broadcasters, right? So they create the programming that goes to the audiences. And who pays for it? Advertisers in the commercial model of broadcasting. All right, So that's why I make a little triangle. And I think, yeah, they make the programs. They watch the programs. And these people pay for the programs for the privilege of being able to insert their ads in, and talk to audiences that way. Okay? All right, I need somebody to log in on this last one. Otherwise, I can't actually run the computer. Is somebody already in? No, I can't yet. Sorry, you didn't have the pin. That's why. And it is 346. Anyone who needs to leave? 329, 140. It's, it's really a, they should let me run it without logging in at all. Whatever, I guess that's a challenge. Thank you. <laughs> and we're on our way. Questions for Chapter 7. Behavioral targeting tracks a user's online activity to deliver customized ads. Is that true or false? That's kind of the future of advertising there. Okay, so it is true. Behavioral targeting means basically, since they can track everything you do while you're online, they build up a profile of what you like, what you're interested in, and then they target you. So this person's interested in athletic shoes, and they'll sell that immediately to, uh, uh, to an advertiser. All right. Television commercials are aired in groups called clusters or pods. So we actually did talk about that. All right, well, we'll just go ahead and say it. Yeah, so it is true. Television commercials are called spots, right? And spots are bundled together in three or four or five, and that's called a cluster or a pod as it's inserted into a television show or a cable show. Program containing ads for a variety of products and brands is supported by? The answer is spot advertising, okay? So we call those spots. If you think back to the original you know, television broadcasting, the, the way that they, they managed to do it, advertisers became sponsors of, an, of a single show. But um, in the late 50s, early 60s, they realized maybe it's better if we have a bunch of short little messages and we share it. We put those into clusters or pods and sell them that way. We can make more money that way. And you're saying that, that, that they that do that for more than one uh, 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 product? Yeah, right. When you watch television like broadcast TV and you see, you know, a Pop-Tart commercial followed by, you know, a kid's, uh, you know, a toy commercial followed by a commercial for mouthwash followed by a commercial for whatever, right? That's how we see them. Yeah. So those are called spots. Each one is a spot. They're pulled together in what's called a cluster. And that's how we see advertising now on TV, these little spots, right? But in 1950, if you turned on TV, that hour would all be dedicated to General Electric because they were the sponsor. I so see. In, in those days, they didn't have spots. 
they had sponsors for a whole show like I Love Lucy was a I think it was you know yes tobacco uh, was supporting her so more cable channels can lead to right your the big audience that you used to have for uh, most shows is now uh, uh, ripped apart fragmented so because you've got more channels, more people can watch different stuff. The audiences, you no longer got millions of people watching the same show. Product placement occurs, well, this is an easy one, thank goodness. Let's see, which one is this? <laughs> Companies pay to have their product featured on the show. All right, that's the one that makes the most sense. Gotta figure that one out. Radio advertising was born in, way back when, oh my God, I won't even remember this. Let's see here. Radio advertising, born in 1922. WEAF aired a 10-minute talk paid by a real estate firm. So that's some of the first advertising was more like an infomercial than any spot type of advertising. So that was way back in 1922, real estate, All right? Number seven, advantages of some kind of advertising include local, flexible, low advertising cost, large audience. So in this case, it's a comparison between TV, internet, and radio. So which one do you think is local, flexible, low cost, pretty large audience? It's radio, is it? Yeah, it's radio, thank goodness. Anyway, so just remember, first of all, locality should tip you off. It's either radio or TV. Low advertising costs, it definitely has to be radio because TV is among the most expensive advertising costs there are. Uh, a form of online advertisement running down a vertical column on the browser window. I remember I showed you one last class, right? It kind of looks like this. And it's an advertiser there, but it's on your web page like that. That is called a skyscraper ad because it's tall. Tall and thin like a skyscraper, okay? You can also have banner ads, which are, you know, like that. Skyscraper's tall and thin. Nine, an advertising agency that can plan, research, create, produce, and place ads in all media is called? Anyone gonna go for it? One person went, it's called a full service agency, okay? A digital agency would only be uh, for <coughs> online or interactive media. Uh, media buying is ad placement, but it doesn't, conf you know, it's not all the rest. A creative boutique is all about planning and creating. The agency that does it all is a full service agency. 10 of 10, the FCC requires programmers to disclose placement sponsors in the show's credits. Boom, we'll go. The answer is true, okay? If it's a political ad, they have to say who paid for this ad in the show credits. If you have any questions about this, stick around, okay? Otherwise, Good luck, we'll see you next class for this. And remember, the, these cahoots are all open for you to play at home.